Evan. Well. Evan, the last time we chatted, you had the dream of doing Boston. In fact, you had qualified to run Boston because you did the time. But pre-pandemic, so many people actually met the qualifying time that if you just be cued, you may or may not have gotten in and you were one that were not able to get in because you needed to do at least a PQ5, meaning five minutes better than your actual qualifying time. Yep. So this year, what happened? This year, I learned dreams do come true. <laughs> the journey to Boston was was pretty long and suspenseful. I ran my first BQ ever back in 2017. It was actually it was the same. It was almost right after my initial episode on this show. And it was amazing just getting to that point. I never thought that, you know, when I started running, I never thought that I would even come close to running a Boston qualifying time. So when I finally did that, it was amazing. And then I didn't realize that it was possible to actually run the BQ, but then get cut off because there were too many applicants who qualified. So that happened to me the first time around, and I thought, oh, okay, well, that's fair. I didn't really realize I have to run much faster. So then I did that the next year, and I got cut out again. And I did it the next year, what you're talking about. I ran a 254, and that particular time, because of the pandemic and the reduced field size, I still didn't get in. 254 wasn't good enough, yeah. But fortunately, BAA was really generous this past year, and they allowed people to use their 2019 marathon times to register for the 2022 Boston Marathon. So I was able to use the 254 again. And this year, everybody that applied got in. And I had the race of my life. I ran 249. It was a PR by five minutes. My and goodness. it was just an amazing experience, amazing day. Everything was amazing about it. Whoa. Oh, whoa, that's fantastic. So everybody that had a PQ Boston qualifier got it. I would imagine there would be a couple of reasons for that, primarily because there weren't that many qualifying races, although they right. were generous in going back to 2019. Right. But do you think everybody had to be vaccinated? That was a requirement. Uh, yeah, and I knew that there were a lot of people who were choosing not to do Boston for, for that reason. Um, you know, people can disagree. I was the happy benefactor of that. <laughs> I'm vaccinated. Uh, and so if people decided they didn't want to run and that meant that all the qualifiers could get in. Um, hey, look, you know, it's great. Great, great, great for and those the who weather, applied. of course, was probably the best weather in like in three or four years. Yeah, every time I didn't get into Boston, I would watch Boston just because I had to see what I missed out on. And it feels like the last few years, the weather was always really bad especially the first time that I could have gotten in was the 2018, like, mega hurricane storm, you know, disaster. And I was just so relieved to be sitting home drinking hot chocolate as I'm watching everybody get poured on that morning. But, um, but yeah, the conditions, I couldn't have asked for better weather. Right. Everything was perfect. I was a meaningful Boston with that, that storm because uh, one of the non-elite women okay. came within elite times. Yep. And the controversy was, who should she get the, uh, the prize money, the, the, the from prize the elite, money yeah. for finishing fourth overall, totally, even yeah. though she wasn't in the elite group. But of course, Boston being Boston, they did the right <laughs> thing. It's that very traditional. It's a no brainer. We've got to give it to her. I yeah. mean, considering that you set the conditions, yep. but you had perfect weather conditions. But this is your first Boston. And typically, First Boston, people, after they'd done it, oh my God, I didn't realize that first mile, because it's all downhill, was really that they had, should have taken it easy. Oh my God, much more hillier than I, was, I thought. But sounded like you did your homework. It was part of it, me doing my homework, but also I had so many awesome friends, runners who had done Boston before. And the whole atmosphere of being in Boston that weekend was just kind of indescribable. I'd just be walking down the street and I'd see somebody, you know, we'd, we'd strike up a conversation about how excited we were about the race and our fears. And a lot of people who had done Boston before were very generous in their wisdom that they shared with me. And the common theme across everyone was don't go out too fast down the hills. It'll be very tempting to take advantage of them if you want to run a fast time. But 
the downhill will really destroy your legs. And by the time you get to the Newton Hills, which are the big uphills on the course, you'll have nothing left in the tank for the last 10K, which is when you really want to be racing. You know, some people say the race doesn't actually begin until mile 20, which is right where Heartbreak Hill right, is right around there. So I just knew I had to be really, really conservative at the start. I just tried to be as patient as possible and just trust that my training would kick in later in the race. And don't get me wrong, I still got my butt kicked by Heart Heartbreak Hill. After that, I, was, I, I couldn't speed up beyond a certain point. I was just hanging on for survival. But I was able to hang on just long enough. I really, really wanted to break two hours, 50 minutes. And it really came down to the last you know, 100 meters where I felt, I don't know if I can keep going beyond this. Crossed the finish line, and I was so broken down, my family actually had to carry me across the street <laughs> to get into the sunlight because I was shivering so much. It was crazy. Wonderful. So interesting that you were able not to go fast that first mile. There's a saying in the ultramarathon world, if you think you're going slow, go slower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you listen to your body. Yeah. So it sounded like you weren't really going by the watch so much. You were going a little bit by feel. Yeah, I mean, I had a pacing strategy on my wrists. Uh, I like to do a mile by mile strategy um, just because I'm very nerdy. So I like to really look at the course elevation profile and take the little pieces of advice that people give me about uh, the specific course strategy. So Boston Marathon, you know, you have these big downhills at the start, but I'm always a slow starter in general. So I like to give myself some slow mile splits at the beginning anyway. So I just had to make sure they were extra slow. And so I knew what I was kind of planning on doing. I went even slower than that. My first mile was supposed to be a 650, and I ended up doing a 706. Part of it was because it was so crowded, but also I knew it wasn't worth trying to weave around other people. Right. There would be plenty of time later on to speed up. Good strategy not to weave, because that's also a problem. Yeah. Now, getting to the Boston starting line, did they take a bus? How, what are the mechanics yeah. of getting there? It's a little similar to New York City Marathon, um, and I've done New York City many times, so I'm used to it being a really tough logistical morning before you run the marathon. In New York City, of course, it's in November, so it's pitch dark, it's freezing. You go to Staten Island and you have to wake up really early for the bus because they have to close the Verrazano at a certain time. With Boston, it was so much easier. And part of the reason why it was really easy for me was because I was staying with some really close family friends who lived really just around the corner from where the shuttles uh, left from to Hopkinton. And so, you know, I just get on the bus, I wake up, it's already sunny outside, which is a very welcome change in the first place. I roll out of bed, go to the bus. We get on the cool, you know, yellow macaroni school buses. They take us to Hopkinton, about 45 minute drive. And while I'm in there, I'm talking to the guy sitting next to me. He's run Boston 19 times and he's telling me all these legendary stories of, you know, this year the weather was 80 degrees and this was the year the buses left without us and we had to take cabs to the start line and all that stuff. And um, it was just thrilling. And the, the start village was so well organized. They had these big tents to give runners shade to sit in so they weren't cooking in the sun. Um, and then Hopkinton itself is, you know, it's a really cool place because you, you walk from the start village to the start line about a half a mile. And people are just coming out of their homes giving people sunscreen, Vaseline, and these fun necklaces. And, you know, it's just, it's got such a local feel. And then at the end, it's got such a booming city feel. It's such a, a special experience. Everybody's got to, you know, experience at some point. Excellent. And what was your starting time? What, uh, what did 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Yeah. Great, great. I think they had like four starting times. Four ways, like, yeah. Like the elites go first or the professionals go first. Right. Then the elites and then yada, 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 you were 10 o'clock. Yeah. What was the last one, 11 or 12? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. I, I would hope earlier than 12, <laughs> but it's possible. Possible. All yeah. right. Uh, you know, the Boston is the oldest marathon in the world. I yeah. think this is, was 110. 26th. 126th Boston Marathon. And because it is the oldest, there's always some really special event. For, I think this was the 50th anniversary of the first time they allowed women to officially run Boston. Wow. So 50 years ago, women were allowed to run Boston. I think seven women did. 
And they all came to cheer because one of the women was going to run it again. Awesome. You know, one of the original seven, or yeah. maybe it was eight. Good Definitely, match. it's historic in so many ways, that being one of them. I mean, one could say they were 76 years too late, but, uh, but you know, the fact that women have been able to compete just as, you know, they, they compete just as hard as the men. Uh, I was so impressed by the women that finished around me because... You know, they're just like any other runner. It's awesome. And, and Boston, you know, even though it, it has the feeling of a sort of exclusive event by nature because you, most people have to qualify, I found that there were still people of all shapes and sizes as well and people coming from all walks of life who were doing Boston. Um, and so, you know, the heart that's required to run the Boston Marathon, to run a marathon in general, is not exclusive to men, women, able, disabled. We talked to Francesco earlier here today. And it's just such a special event to be a part of in so many ways. It's a, it's a very celebratory event because everybody had to work really hard just to get there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. And then to wrap up, two things. Professionally, what do you got coming up? And you're, you're a totally. filmmaker, right? Yep. So what's coming up uh, in, uh, in your professional life? So I'm working on a new feature film. Um, I'm working in production and in post-production on the film with uh, Evan Oppenheimer. He's the same director who I worked with on my most recent big feature film, The Magnificent Meyersons. And so we're in production right now. We're about to ramp up uh, the rest of the film. We've shot a bit of it. Now we're going to shoot the rest of it. And then I'm going to be editing the film afterwards. So very excited about that. It's like my big next long-term project. And, um, and then the other thing that I'm doing is coaching. I've actually I've become an RCA certified uh, running coach. And uh, I'm wearing my shirt right here, just another running coach. Um, and I've been coaching runners get more comfortable with running in general, not necessarily going for time goals, but they just want to feel better while doing it. And then there are other folks who are, who are uh, training to accomplish something like run a marathon or run their fastest time. And that's been very fun and fulfilling. Uh, and I've been so excited to be a part of other runners' journeys in this sort of professional way. That's excellent, excellent. Not every um, good runner also turns out to be a good coach. It's, it's a different kind of a skill set. You've got to have good listening skills. Totally. And, and totally. And you also want uh, people that are, that are willing to be coached. Yeah. Sometimes you, you get people, they, they, they're in a rush, and somehow you have to manage expectations. So it's a totally. process. Yeah, yeah. I just think back to like the, the people who encouraged me when I was new at running. And, you know, I, I've never had an official coach, like personal coach that I had. But I had a lot of coach type figures and a lot of mentors. You know, Dr. Keith Benkov was the captain of my charity team, Team IBD Kids. And he was my, also my gastroenterologist for most of my life. And, you know, an amazing marathon runner himself. He was really sort of a father figure to me. John Hirsch, who was the captain and coach of Team Continuum, which is a charity team that I had trained with for my first few summers doing the New York City Marathon. So I had a lot of those coach type figures. And, you know, I was always feeling so encouraged and so supported, despite being someone with an autoimmune disease, who wouldn't ordinarily, you wouldn't ordinarily think of somebody with Crohn's as somebody who is capable of running a marathon or running a marathon fast. Um, and so I think just the fact that the people that I had around me, the focus wasn't on trying to be competitive and trying to, or trying to get really fit. It was about having fun and it was about finding the things that I found to be really fulfilling about the process. So as a coach, I'm always trying to find those things that make it really fun and enjoyable. And I love running with my athletes and I love just chatting about everyday life. And then we get down into the nuts and bolts of like, what's a tempo run? What's, why are we doing these intervals? And like, how does that physiologically help us be our best, you know, best version of ourselves? Excellent. Yeah, we almost forgot that you have Crohn's disease. Yep. And, uh, Still have it. <laughs> it's an incurable disease, but very manageable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm feeling great, by the way. Uh, I had surgery back in 2020, and it was my first Crohn's-related surgery. I had two feet of my small intestine taken out. And that was crazy. It was the first time in my life since I started running where I had to take a prolonged break from running, which was really hard, because as I was learning to walk again, seeing all the runners running by, it was like, ah, I wish I could be doing that. But, um, but thankfully, that was the best decision I ever could have made for my health. I feel amazing. Um, I would say, you know, I'm probably in the best shape I've ever been in. And, um, you know, I'm just 
I'm, the battle against IBD is never over till we have a cure. So as long as I have Crohn's and as long as other people have Crohn's, I'm still going to be out there doing my thing, trying to improve, trying to run faster. Next, athletically, what is your next dream race? Do you have a dream oh, race or goal race? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I always want to do the New York City Marathon every year that I possibly can. My, my not-so-secret agenda, as I like to tell the people around me, is that I want to end up with the longest streak of New York City marathons ever. Now, there's a long way to go, um, but this year will be number nine. So to me, that's always a dream race. And then other than that, I would like to hit the other majors. Um, Chicago will probably be the next one that I'm targeting. Uh, wouldn't be this year, but maybe in the future. But I would love to travel and, and race. Boston was my first time traveling for a race. So that experience of going somewhere and interacting with the other runners who also traveled and having like, you know, my family with me and, and whatever, it was, it was a very special feeling. So I'm looking forward to doing that many more times and, uh, and we'll see where it takes me. I don't know. Excellent. Well, we look forward to these further adventures of Evan, filmmaker, athlete, marathon runner. <laughs> Thank you, Well, It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming in. Absolutely. <laughs> this has been a Gotta Run With Will moment. I just had a great conversation with Francesco Magisano. Please check it out on YouTube. You can also find it there. And I just want to thank everybody who supported me on my own journey. Uh, I've been super inspired by runners just like Francesco all along the way. It's an honor to have them be a part of my journey and for me to be a part of theirs. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm living the dream. That's all I can say. So it's great to see you. Until next time, gotta run. I just had an awesome conversation with my friend Evan Wood. You can catch it on YouTube. As for me, I would love to thank Achilles International. We involve people with disabilities in mainstream endurance sports. They did that with me, and now as an employee, I get to do that with so many other people with disabilities. Till next time, gotta run. <laughs>